Least we forget the wartime memories of Colonel Hugo J. Ponsonby, Volume 1 from Sitzkrieg to Blitzkrieg by P. K. Richer. When it was first suggested to me that I document some of my experiences during the Second World War, I was so thoroughly repulsed by the notion that I threw up all down myself. The vast majority of my experiences around that time, you see, having been really rather shockingly painful and distressing. Who on earth, I wondered, would be interested in reading about my diarrhoea and vomit, near starvation, traumatic amputations and whiffy pus, dog fights, machine guns and barbed wire, all those damned psychotic sausage-eating Nazis. Nobody in their right mind, certainly. I had, of course, already published several autobiographical works by then. My early school years at Westbury Grange are detailed in The Boy in the Blue Blazer and those difficult times which I spent at St. Deferen's Bagshot Manor. And then Mandersbury House were committed to the page of The Bounder. The last work in the trilogy and by far the most excruciating for me to undertake. The Making of the Man, documented by my horrendously chaotic transformation from a snot-nosed officer cadet at Letchworth Military Academy to manhood proper and my very first command. All of this paled in comparison to the idea of recounting the horrendous events of the war years though. Indeed, the idea filled me with such an icy dread that I vomited again. The issue did continue to nag at me, however, and over time I began to allow a few of the less horrendous moments to filter through from memory. The years 1939 through 1945 were both terrifying and life-affirming. During that period I made some of the very dearest chums that a chap could ever possibly have. Unfortunately, I saw most of them either shot dead or blown to bloody pieces right before my eyes. The Diarist I have, since the days of Westbury Grange, been an avid diarist and the volumes which I have accumulated over the years have proven to be extremely useful in filling in some of the many gaping voids which now exist in my rapidly decaying mind. One diary entry which will remain with me, though, since it inspired the entire chapter of Peasant Auntie in The Making of the Man read, Dear Diary, I cannot believe it. The German Chancellor looks like Charlie Chaplin. I tripped over it in the quad and stabbed myself in the eye with my pipe. And all front of Sissy Frogmore, Mayweather, bugger. Colonel Gainsborough commended me on my steely resolve. As language can change and evolve so rapidly, I intend to include a glossary of phrases and slang terms particular to the era. Whether or not this shall make it into the first edition, though, remains to be seen. It is for any reader who may be unfamiliar with my early works that I include this short about the author. T. T is the very lifeblood of the British Army and of every true-hearted Englishman. I'm talking here of property, mind you, not the awful green stuff which masquerades under the name in some of the more backward parts of the world. T is made from the leaves of the evergreen shrub, Camellia sinensis, of the family Theosea. It's known to have been used in China since 2737 BC, but was first brought to Europe around 1610 AD and remains second only to water, the most frequently imbibed drink in the entire world. Only the tips, one bud plus the first pair of leaves, are plucked from the bush, and proper tea undergoes an oxidisation process which turns the green leaves to dark brown or black colour. The longer the oxidisation, the stronger and darker the brew. Popular varieties of black or red tea are Assam, Naples, Darjeeling, Niljari, Turkish and Ceylon. The perfect cup of tea requires fine bone china crockery and freshly drawn water. The pop should be warm first and always brought to the kettle 
never the kettle to the pot, or else the temperature of the water can quickly fall below the critical value necessary for proper infusion to take place. The strength of the tea is varied by adjusting the amount of leaves added to the pot, and not its steeping time. Stronger teas like Assam are prepared with more leaves, whilst those which are more delicate and high grown, such as Darjeeling, with somewhat fewer, as the most robust mid flowers can sometimes overwhelm the subtle champagne notes. One slightly heaped teaspoonful per person, plus one for the pot, is a very reasonable guide added.